The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the third lecture out of three, covering my version of Barvinsky's Prelude in G Major, the selection for the 2022 Orchestration Challenge. If you haven't yet watched the first two chapters, then click on the playlist link in the information below and start with the first video. Otherwise, you may miss some context in this chapter. As you may recall from part two, I divided the section at rehearsal letter D into equal 11-bar halves. Most of the first half in both the piano score and my orchestration involves building up to a massive tutti. Now we're going to look at that tutti in this second half, starting with the piano score. Some of my longtime viewers have heard me say that tutis can often involve the simplest kind of scoring for all their impressive showiness and grandeur. This page of the Barvinsky Piano Prelude is no different in what it offers as a potential orchestral climax. That doesn't mean that this would be easy to play for the pianist, nor that it's harmonically simple. Far from it. But rather, it's functionally straightforward. Repeated chords in both hands, the left hand playing over different voicings from below in little arpeggiated arcs, an octave melody above, sometimes incorporating the notes of the right hand repeated chords, and booming octaves below, grounding each bar like tolling bells. And that is the approach for the entire 11 bars, with the only real changes coming from the harmonic and emotional progression, plus the melodic arc's articulation and guidance of the music's meaning. Putting on our orchestrator hats, let's examine each of these functions for potential problems, if transcribed from piano directly to our wider palette of instruments. The first thing to notice is that the octave melody is closely positioned around the hammering intervals and chords of the right hand. If the orchestrator limits the pitches exactly to those of the piano score, then the melody might become overwhelmed. So it may require some kind of bulking up, or stacking of a further octave on top in order to clearly balance against the chords, or both. Those chords aren't without risks either. If they're orchestrated exactly the same throughout, 
the music may start to lack meaning, and instead feel like the same information shouted at the listener over and over. The orchestrator may see the need to develop and augment the texture and scope of those chords in order to match the emotional progression of the passage. And that's only the beginning, because as the melody starts descending from that high C sharp all the way down an octave and then further, the strengths and colors of certain instrumental registers will shift, requiring careful balancing, and perhaps even the sharing or swapping of roles. Then at the allargando, the last bar of repeated chords cannot be allowed to sag dynamically. That would ruin the effect of the sustained octaves, emerging out of the decaying harmony in the next bar. So the dynamics have to stay strong, which for the orchestrator just brings up the ongoing issue of phrasing through instrumental color. As to those rock bottom octaves, my impulse is to keep them solid and simple, because goodness knows that there's already plenty else to worry about. There's one possible added concern that this leaves a hole in the harmony between those octaves and the chords, which may need to be filled in here or there. That's my view of what needs to happen here, but I'm very much open to that role being adjusted by any other orchestrator participating in this year's challenge, as much as I am any other function on this page. All that aside, if an approach works, then it works, and I'll be delighted to analyze why and how in the upcoming evaluations. But here in my timeline, well before I've looked over anyone else's score, those are the criteria upon which I'll be basing my approach to this epic section of Barvinsky's piece. So let's think about those factors while we have a listen to Violina Petrochenko's interpretation of the passage. The hammering chords, the octave melody, and the low bass octaves, each requiring careful scoring in order to preserve both their impact and their narrative. my conclusions about how to capture the brimming excitement and over-the-top momentum. Notice the tempo marking of precipitoso, indicating a kind of reckless, headlong pace. That word may sound a bit flowery, but it's a pretty accurate description of the tempo and character of Violina's interpretation we just heard. You can also see that I've maintained the dynamic proportions of the previous page, with the winds and strings one degree hotter than the brass. In my own scoring, I treat triple F, or forte fortissimo, as being the greatest general strength an instrument can be played musically, with quadruple forte as being so strong as to become somewhat less about musicality and more about sheer noise. But no need to get that overly loud in this piece. Triple forte is strong enough, with the brass swelling nearly to that dynamic in the middle of each bar. As intense as this page may look, I feel it to be rather simple in design, while at times intricate in construction. The roles of each function line up with an easily identifiable group of instruments throughout, at least on this page of score, hammering triplets going to most of the heavy brass, ferocious tolling octaves to the lower winds and strings, and the harmonized melody to the upper winds and strings, plus horns and E-flat trumpet. Remember how I mentioned that the melody might need to be augmented in some way or stacked higher? Here I've chosen to do both, in both directions. The E-flat trumpet and third and fourth horns form a triple octave, with the fourth horn adding an octave below to the melody as written in the original piano score. The first and second horn actually play the harmony around those octaves, over some of the same notes as in the hammered chords, but doubling up with the other horns on the melody at the pickup to bar 49. Before I talk about the strings and winds, though, just a few more words about that E-flat trumpet part. As on the previous page, it's taking the top line of the piano's octave melody, and because of the intensity of its sound, it'll really scorch over both the horns and repeated chords in the heavy brass, offering a firm foundation to the instruments above it while not necessarily shouting over them with its overtones. The completist in me would probably rescore this part without a key signature, then shift all the notes to their enharmonic equivalents, 
just to simplify the player's role visually. But even with all those double sharps, it's a part that should be easily playable by any accomplished pro third chair, who'd probably be assigned to E-flat trumpet were it to be performed. Now let's consider the upper winds and strings, which is hard to do without addressing the elephant, or rather the hurricane in the room. Those furious, flurrying lines in flutes, clarinets, and violins. Notice that none of them are identical to one another, with even the second and fourth gestures having the difference of B sharp and B natural between them. These lines are challenging, but within the realm of possibility for the players. I make things easier by alternating between chairs for the winds and sections for the violins. One subtle point, while the winds have the first chairs covering the first and third flurries, and the second or third chairs alternating, I actually assign the first violins to the alternating flurries. This is so that they can come out of them right into that top line, something that the winds don't have to worry about because of the roll of the piccolo on top. And that leads us right back to considering the melody because these flurries are in a sense an extension of the melody, starting on and leading back to the notes of the melody each time. Once you look at it that way, everything else falls right into place. The strings are just stacking an octave above the melody from the piano score, the second violins and violas doubling the same line as the E-flat trumpet, with additional fattening by English horn, and occasionally from first clarinet. While the first violins soar an octave above, doubled by piccolo, with the flutes tag-teaming the top line. Bolstered by the overtones of the E-flat trumpet below, that top line should shine with its own light. It just remains to mention the harmonic roll of oboes throughout, with some thickening trading off from flutes and clarinets when they're not doubling the melody or the flurries. The result, when all the elements are added together, should be a rich, integrated sound that can be easily heard over the repeated chords on the heavy brass. Speaking of which, let's focus on those chords while keeping the whole brass section in view. I could have filled in all the gaps here for one continuous stream of chords in transcribing them to the trumpets and trombones, but instead I've left in some gaps, mostly at the beginning and middle of bars, while filling in others. This helps to maintain and even clarify the shape of the little arpeggiated arcs in the trombones. I have, however, added tuba blasting away on the same low notes that we'll look at in cellos and bassoons in a minute. I feel this gives more shape and urgency to the rest of the heavy brass, rather than just leaving them there in the middle to snap at the winds and strings. The closeness of those fortissimo accents in trumpets to the melody is another great reason to score that melody on E-flat trumpet and thicken it further with the added strings and winds I mentioned a minute ago. At the end of the page, you'll notice that I've left out the horns on the pickup into bar 51. This is because they're not really needed on that beat, due to the heavy brass already injecting plenty of energy into the rising arc of the music. That just leaves the thundering bass octaves, which are transcribed directly onto second bassoon and contrabassoon, with the bass clarinet and first bassoon filling in the additional octave above. This triple octave is doubled by cellos and basses, assuming basses with the low C extension or fifth string, with alternate mini notes written in for standard four-string instruments with no extensions. At the end of the page, when the lowest piano note reaches all the way down to a subterranean B0, I simply jump up an octave with the lower strings, instead of assuming the basses will tune down all the way to that low B. I'd find that unnecessary for such a brief moment, especially considering the capacity of the contrabassoon to keep digging in down there. The downbeat thump from bass drum is marked down to a mere forte, as I simply want to add a touch of punctuation to the bass octaves, and not a mighty obliterating stroke. And of course, as previously mentioned, the tuba plays a role here in tying the rest of the heavy brass to the bass line. So let's have a listen to this page again with the mock-up. Here I feel that note performer isn't quite accurate. The flurries would probably be more fluid and prominent, and the colors in the upper winds much brighter than you'll hear in a few seconds. The problem is in the generalization of instrumental timbre, especially as you'll hear in the heavy brass but it's not bad and gets across most of what the orchestration should sound like. Now that 
I've described the overall strategy in detail, it should be easier to pick out the same roles in the following screen. With those flurries omitted, the roles and positioning of upper winds and upper strings become very clear as they work their way down from that sky-high C-sharp all the way to a ninth lower at the ritardando. Just as before, the violins and violas play a simple octave, with wind doubling mostly the same, piccolo and first flute on the top line, and second clarinet plus E-flat trumpet covering the bottom. There's just a tiny bit of doubling of that lower line covered by second oboe at the end of bar 51. Otherwise, third flute, oboes, English horn, and first clarinet team up to fill in the harmony around those descending octaves. This is a very old trick, which I've mentioned frequently before, but in case you missed it, it's easy to get a very full-fleshed sound like this in a tutti if you keep the strings on octaves and the winds and brass playing a more comprehensive harmony. That creates the illusion that the strings are also playing some of those harmonic pitches. Sometimes it's the only way that strings can meaningfully contribute at all to a blasting tutti like this one. The rock bottom octaves and bass drum punctuation also take the same roles as before from the start of the page through to the ritardando. A couple little adjustments to notice. The cellos and basses stay an octave higher on the first bar, as the low A sharp is still out of range, but then jump back down to cover the repeated D sharps. Also, I ask for a low A sharp for my contrabassoon on that same bar, while providing an alternate mini note an octave higher. This is more of a question of tone quality for the player and the conductor, rather than any limitation for the instrument. If they feel that the B-flat sounds too grunty in the absence of the bass's doubling, then they have the option of taking it up an octave. Over the past couple of minutes, you'll have noticed that I left out any mention of those instances in which the middle voice repeated chords spill over into the winds and strings, but don't worry, I'm just saving the funnest part for last. But before I dive into that, Let's review some of my criteria from our earlier discussion of the piano part. You can see that the scoring here reflects those concerns, developing and augmenting the texture and scope of the repeated chords so that they don't hammer away on the same instruments for too long, swapping and sharing instrumental roles as the music descends, while carefully balancing the dynamics so as not to drown out the melody. And lastly, keeping the dynamic strong at the allargando, which I've chosen to interpret with an anticipatory retard, then a meno, then another retard. I'll cover that last bar in a little while. For now, let's start our focus on the scoring of those repeated chords from the beginning of the page. On the previous screen, I'd simply transcribe those chords onto the heavy brass, with a surge at the middle of each bar. Now I want to underline those surges with greater urgency, starting at a softer forte, then pushing into the middle of each bar up to forte fortissimo. Notice the added sixteenths there. Da 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 da! With the heavy brass holding onto the chords for the rest of the bar while dropping back down dynamically. Also, check out the interdependency in those first two bars with the horns, which start out by harmonically supporting the upper winds and strings, with even a sounding C sharp melody note in first horn, but then take over the role of the repeating chords from trumpets and trombones to keep the momentum going. I underline this swelling of energy with timpani rolling into that accented middle bar with a cymbal crash right in the center. That all feels very exciting to me, but if I were to maintain this same strategy for more than a couple of bars, it would soon wear out its welcome. So it's time to shift some rolls around over the next four bars and alternate between two different kinds of texture. On the third and fifth bars, I let the horns loose in a reinterpretation of the chords that leaps all the way up to their top octave and back, with some support from below by bass trombone and tuba. I'm pushing that bass trombone a little high, perfectly playable by any seasoned professional trombonist, of course, but I want that stressed sound at the peak above the bass staff. I also change around the tuba, in the middle of the bass staff the first time, then an octave lower the second time. That shift plus leaving out the tuba on the alternate bars, also helps keep it from becoming a too familiar element. The violas cover the first horn line, and upper divisi cellos double the bass trombone, and while they'll tend to be a little outplayed here, a touch of string sound will come through, and that's all I need. 
Meanwhile, C trumpets and tenor trombones add some middle register oomph to the harmony, over which the horns are cartwheeling. Just a little side note here before I forget. Throughout these alternating bars, the timpani continues to surge into the middle of each bar, but shifting back and forth between a lower and higher rolled D sharp. Suspended cymbal joins in to really brighten things up on the second pair of bars, and to emphasize the tension and release inherent in the phrasing. The fourth and sixth bars are scored to burst forth with alternating splashes of color and light, while also following the same restructuring of the repeated chords into arcs. The basic line can be seen in the Divisi second violins, more or less outlining the structure in octaves, doubled by third flute on top, and English horn plus first trumpet on the bottom. Oboes, first clarinet, and second trumpet harmonize those octaves, with first trombone slamming away at those same D sharps in the fourth bar, then with both tenor trombones joining in the arc in very close harmonies with the trumpets in the sixth bar. Notice that I have the winds and second violins cascade downward in sixteenths to help redirect the attention of the listener down to the grinding pickup to the next bar. And at this point, I opt for a heavily scored stack of octaves. English horn, first clarinet, first and third horn, all the trumpets, and all the violins on the top voice. Then second clarinet, bass clarinet, first bassoon, second and fourth horns, tenor trombones, violas, and upper divisi cellos on the next voice down, underpinned by second bassoon, contrabassoon, bass trombone, tuba, lower divisi cellos, and double basses. I drop the lowest instruments down to the low E from the piano score on the downbeat of the next bar. Hold on to those final Bs in E-flat trumpet, English horn, clarinets, and first violins, and then drag away at the repeated chords with a portato articulation, those slurred tenutos, in the rest of the brass plus the middle strings. I'll go just a little way further into section E by pointing out that, just like in the piano score, these pitches are held at the beginning of the next bar, then are marked to quickly decay just as held piano chords would. The first violins keep the B octaves going as pianissimo tremolos, as the melody rises through the bass instruments. Here I wanted to simulate the characteristics of the piano's quality of attack and sustain, so I doubled contrabassoon with pizzicato double basses, followed by bass clarinet doubled by harp, and then low English horn doubled by pizzicato cellos. Where does that lead? Into the next section, which we'll look over in a couple of minutes. But first, Let's have a listen to everything I just talked about. The descending melody and the bass octaves pretty much keeping to their roles from the previous page, but the repeated chords texturally developing with different combinations and reinterpretations, all the way up to the big crush and drag at the meno, then dying off to a very subtle, spooky sound picture at the end. The mock-up is okay here, but a real orchestra would have much more clarity, especially on those arcs in the horn and the winds. Here in the criteria screen for the last section, you can see that I've already addressed some of my concerns for the first two bars, negotiating a fade from the tutti instruments into the middle of the bar, with those B octaves continuing to stand out alone, rising melody underlining solitude, already sorted, as you heard, by the combination of little rising, trading off wind solos punctuated by plucked instruments. From there, it's important to stress that the marking piano espressivo really refers to the left-hand octave melody, which should be kept in the foreground, while the delicious icy right-hand part is more harmonic, or at best a secondary commentary or expansion of the sound picture. As the passage progresses, the lower part should still stay prominent, but there's an implied leap between the parts, as the listener's attention is yanked from the rising tenuto notes in the bass staff, all the way up to those thirds descending over the top of the next bar. The little three-bar section that follows starts with a callback to the end of the opening, 
with some clever chromatic tweaking to prevent it from ending in E minor like before. The independence of the middle voice will be no less important here than it was back there. Then the unaccompanied bar stating the theme again cries out for some momentous, attention-getting solo instrument that can express that simple phrase with calm but unforgettable eloquence, or at least that's what I hear there, and that calm has to be maintained as we anticipate the coming conclusion. Then, as the melody descends, it starts to outline some of the harmony of the final chord. To what extent can I emulate the effect of the sustain pedal in keeping those tones in the sound picture through to the end? Think about those things as we listen to Violina Petrochenko's reading of this last page. Here I felt that her command of colors and subtleties of nuance were the most impactful for me as an orchestrator, in suggesting how to reinterpret the music, and it was certainly this section which helped me decide that Barvinsky's Prelude was going to be our selection for the 2022 Orchestration Challenge. The music is in some ways coming around full circle, in other ways not, so I decided to take the same approach with the orchestration, calling back to some of the same elements as the opening, but not slavishly. There are actually more differences than similarities, which also helps to keep the music fresh. But you'll witness the return of some familiar faces and situations, like our old friend the alto flute. As the English horn pushes into its mezzo forte dynamic in the next bar, the alto flute slides in above it at an octave doubling, and then follows it down to those low sounding E's. This represents a very cool combination for those instruments, if the players take care to balance, with that heavy lowest note of the English horn below, and the velvety alto flute an octave above. Around them, I've directly transcribed the harmony onto flutes, oboes, and clarinets for a glowing background texture. This hangs on, overlapping into the answering viola and cello octaves, which themselves are thickened and darkened a little by bass clarinet and first bassoon. The clarino register of the bass clarinet when played softly will have an almost flute-like sound, a wonderful combination with the throatier tone of the violas. Bringing back the upper winds harmonically just as they were before seems too redundant, so I've added tremolo first and second violins, bringing them into the foreground a little dynamically. I want to see the last of the winter frost under the trees, before I inject the sunshine. Which I start to do with the entrance of first horn with violas tracking from above at the octave. Allowing the instruments to push into bar 66 all the way up to forte is a great way to create an emotional contrast with the simpler scoring to follow. One last burst of anxiety and doubt, as it were. I have the horn, doubled at pitch by cellos, complete its line by borrowing the lower voice of the descending thirds above, and playing it in a more natural register. And now for the most direct callback in the next three bars, starting by scoring the first bar exactly as I did in the opening at bar 9, with octave E's in first violins and cellos, doubled by first flute and horn, English horn and first bassoon working in parallel harmony, with a little help from violas, and then letting those voices evolve and settle downwards, 
To be absolutely sure of wrapping up the phrase the right way, I added fermatas, and then a breath on the last eighth rest. I also took out the horn doubling, as the cellos didn't really need it, making it possible for that horn to enter the music again as a fresh voice, almost sounding like a different instrument in its upper register. Then I made the harmony into a reaction in strings playing fingered tremolo, as if this new warmth over the landscape is bringing in a quick breeze to make the leaves tremble. I hold on to that tremolo for another bar, writing out the role in the piano as a slower arpeggio on harp, under an answering call by first clarinet, which works its way down, dovetailing to bass clarinet. Notice that, similar to before, I chose a spot near the clarinet's throat tones to trade off to the bass clarinet's lower clarina register for a seamless transition in tone quality. I let go of the harmony in the strings by the middle of the bar, and then as the bass clarinet works its way downwards, I add a sustaining pitch in strings to each of its succeeding melodic tones. That is one way to simulate the effect of the piano's damper pedal. The bass clarinet can't reach all the way down to the sounding low G at the bottom, but it will blend so softly into the lower divisi cellos on that low D that there's really no need for further doubling of that line on the winds, especially not by contrabassoon, which might unnecessarily thicken the timbre. It's enough to just let the basses play that low G. Similarly, since the sustained tones of the strings are already outlining most of the rest of the harmony, it's only necessary to add an open G to the violin's held E note. A simple enough procedure, just leaning the bow over further to the left to catch that lower string. The result should be a concluding chord that just floats away. Let's have a listen to my mock-up along to this screen, which I feel is pretty accurate this time, though of course no substitute for the color and subtlety of a great live orchestra. Since the music is fairly simple, and I've really prepared you for my overall scoring approach by now if you've watched all three lectures, what I'd suggest focusing on is how I frame the melody in each successive phrase, whether with simplicity, or a little distance, or intimacy, or even silence followed by a rustling of emotion. But before I leave you on those notes, I just want to thank everyone who's joined me on this two-hour, 15,000-word journey. Please let me know what you think of this new editing style, with close-ups, colored staves, and framing boxes, as opposed to my old style with a moving cursor over a screen of staves. I feel that this is a more focused way of getting my information across, and it wastes less time, though it's more intense to digest. But, of course, I'll be sticking to the old style of doing things for the orchestration challenge evaluations. Thanks to my supporters on Patreon for making this possible, and my viewers and subscribers here on the channel and the website, and all my friends in the Orchestration Online Facebook group and the affiliated groups. You're all awesome, and you've been so much fun to hang out with. Huge gratitude to Violina Petrachenko for permission to use her recording, and my most heartfelt wishes to the Ukrainian people for an end to the current crisis, and a restoration of their safety, well-being, and human rights. And with that, I bid you farewell for now, with a huge avalanche of videos to come over the month of September. Here's that mock-up, and I'll see you soon.